All right, everyone, welcome to Southeast Online. We are thrilled that you are here. I'm Stephen, and you are. I'm Kelsey. No, <laughs> she's got it, guys. <laughs> happy spring, uh, happy March. All the things are happening right All now. All the things, guys. We are so excited to have you joining us today. Please engage with us. Let us know what's going on. Yep. Chat with us in the chat box. Let us know any prayer requests that you have, where you're coming from, uh, what's your favorite part of the sermon. And as always, if you have anything that you need a member of our team to connect with you on, text CONNECT to 733-733 and a real human from our team will touch base with you. Yeah, it is real people happening here and we just want to make that, we want to put some flesh on it, yeah. okay? So right now, Derek Snyder, part of the SE Online team, is not here. He's in New Mexico with Rob and Gloria Miller. And we love getting to connect with our online family. Derek, tell us, what's happening in New Mexico, buddy? Hey, Stephen and Kelsey. I am in Berlin, New Mexico, in a place they call the High Desert. Uh, but they did not tell me it would be so cold uh, here <laughs> this weekend. Uh, this morning, it was uh, actually like 20 degrees. It's a little warmer now, uh, but it's it was really, really cold. <laughs> but we've had a great time connecting with Rob and Gloria. Uh, they have a, a motorcycle ministry here called Unqualified Christian Riders. It's been so cool to just see them do what they do and share Christ with other people. Uh, we've got to go around and see some of the places that are so spiritually important to them. It's been really awesome to connect with them in person, get to know them better, uh, and just hang out as an online family. Man, Derek, it sounds like you all have had so much fun on this trip so far. I just have a question for Rob. Rob, what? How? Please just explain to me and our people, how does somebody from New Mexico get connected with a church yeah. in Louisville, Kentucky? Love how does that. that happen? All right. All right, Rob. Kelsey wants to know, how does a family in Vila, New Mexico find a church family in Louisville, Kentucky? Well, for years, we had uh, used Kyle's books and studies in uh, church groups and with friends and whatnot. And so I knew that I believed in what he was preaching about and, uh, and where he was coming from. Uh, as my anxiety became more debilitating, it was really hard to be in a church and, and focus and learn the word. I wasn't grasping anything. When I learned about Southeast Online, I was able to sit in the comfort of my own home, really grasp the word, soak it in, and be able to take what was taught and bring it out into the community to uh, share it with other people. And so it's been really like family to us. It, it's, you know, between online Bible groups and whatnot, it's really been a family. Yeah, oh, Rob, I love, I love hearing that. Yeah, that, we use that family word intentionally. Derek and Rob, thank you so much. Uh, Kelsey, it's just fun to see that, isn't it? Yeah, thanks for hopping on with us. Yeah, that's so good. Guys, we're in the middle of a sermon series uh, on sexuality and discipleship. Get us set for this weekend. Who we yeah, got? it's been great so far, guys. You don't want to miss out this week. We have Sam Alberry from all the way across the pond in London, England, who's going to be here with us. He's talking about a pretty heavy topic, though. It is, why does God care who I sleep with? Which takes me right into what I want to let you all know is obviously you can tell from the title that may not be for everyone that's listening to this right now. So we've got great children's content. Make sure you check that out. Links in the chat there. Uh, check that out. But we continue on a very timely, important series with yeah. all of this. It matters. And as a matter of fact, after service, I'm going to be joined by Sam right here. Uh, and we're going to be talking about uh, just a bit more. We're going to carry on the conversation uh, just beyond this. So, Kelsey, thank you for being here. Yeah, Love happy having to you. be here. And uh, we're glad that you're here. So dial in, tune in, stay to the very end. i got a lot of ends there. But here is <laughs> service. Guys, I'll catch you after. Bye, guys.
love singing that there's joy in the house of the Lord today. And it's also true that there's awkwardness in the house of the Lord today, right? <laughs> like we're in week three of this series on sexuality and discipleship, and there's some parts of that that's an awkward conversation. But what we've said from the very beginning is that this is the most appropriate place to talk through these things because it was all God's idea. He designed it, he came up with it, and, and so we said in week one that a lot of this conversation comes down to what do you believe about the first sentence of the Bible? In the beginning, God created. Do you believe that we're here by accident and when we die, you know, that's all there is? Because if that's what you believe, then you and I, we're gonna have some very different ideas. We're gonna reach some very different conclusions around sexuality. But if you believe that in the beginning God created, then you believe that there is a divine design to the world we live in, to our bodies, to our sexuality. And what matters to us is to know what's God's plan, what's God's purpose, what's, what's God's best, what's his design for us in this area of our lives. So it can be an awkward conversation, but it's an important one. I hope that if this is your first week jumping into this series, that you'll go back and listen to the first two weeks. I think it's really important in this series that you listen to each message in context of the whole. Uh, it's really important that you be here next week. Next week's gonna be a significant week as we wrap up this series. If you can't make it on Sunday, come to uh, one of our Thursday services at Blankenbaker, Indiana, or the Grange. Um, but listen to each message in the context of the whole, especially do that before, if you're gonna send me a message, especially you do it before you send me a message. Just listen to, <laughs> listen to the whole thing first. I think that really is helpful, it's, it's important. It's impossible within 30, 40 minutes to have as much of the conversation as we would wanna have. So listen to the whole series. Uh, when I first was planning this series, I thought, okay, we'll do four weeks on sexuality, I'll do one week, I'll have three guest speakers come in <laughs> for the rest of the time because, you know, that felt a little bit more comfortable, bring in some subject matter experts and I'll sit and take notes. And, but when I was planning this series that way, an elder kind of pushed back on me with this and he said, you know, I think you should flip that. I think you need to do at least three. I think that the church family needs to hear from you on this and you know, why are you reluctant to do it? He said, is it because you're uncomfortable? I said, no, that really isn't it. I mean, I've been preaching at this church for almost 20 years, I'm used to uncomfortable conversations and it's just as uncomfortable for you as it is for me, so I, I don't think that's it. it I said, I, I think it's more um, unworthy, unworthy. I mean, not just because I know my own sins and struggles and temptations, but because I know that there are a lot of you coming into this with circumstances that are difficult for me to understand or appreciate. I know for some of you, it's especially hard to listen to, to me talk through some of these things. I've got married young. I've been married 27 years and come off often. That's well easy for you to say. And so I, I just felt unworthy or unqualified. I, I just know how, how many different perspectives and how nuanced the conversation can be. But he pushed me on it, and I know he was right that our Foundation here is, is always God's word. It's, it's his message. It's not as much about the messenger. And, and, and we wanna continually point people to Jesus. And so I'm only having one guest speaker in, and I'm glad you're gonna get to hear him today. Um, Sam Alberry has been helping lead the global church around some difficult conversations concerning sexuality in a way that is very gospel-focused. Um, God has used... Um, him, his personal experiences, his wisdom, his biblical commitment. Um, he's used him to help the church around the world talk through some of these things. And so I'm really honored that he would spend some time with us today. Uh, I hope by listening to him today, it'll connect you to some of his other resources online. I wanna let you know that tonight at 6.30, uh, he and I are gonna have a conversation on this stage. It'll be a family conversation, and I'm gonna ask him questions that will make everybody super uncomfortable. Um, but it's a family conversation, it's really for our church family. We don't have childcare, but I would love to invite you to come back tonight at 6.30 to listen in uh, on the conversation that he and I are gonna have together. Um, Sam's written a number of books um, that I would encourage you to pick up, but one of his books is called Why Does God Care Who I Sleep With? Um, that is the title of his message today. Would you please welcome my brother, Sam Alberry?
Good morning. It's a joy to be with you. Thank you, Carl, for your invitation. Thank you all for your welcome and for, for having me this week. Um, why does God care who I sleep with is our, is our question this morning. It's a compelling question. Uh, it's a compelling question any week of the year, but this week of all weeks, as we look around the world today, we're very conscious there's no shortage of awfulness that we see in the world. Um, and as we look at the events in eastern Ukraine, we can be tempted to think, well, I mean, God's got bigger things to think about than what some of us get up to in the privacy of our own bedrooms. There's issues of injustice, there's issues of poverty, there's issues with our planet, there's issues of abuse. Surely if God really does exist, he's got bigger fish to fry. Why would he care who we sleep with? But it's not just a compelling question, it's a very personal question. This gets to the experience of each one of us. Each one of us is a sexual being. God has designed us that way. He saw fit to give us sexual energy. As Carl said, we, this was his idea. We, we didn't discover sex behind God's back. And so this question is relevant to all of us. All of us have a story when it comes to sexuality. And so this is deeply personal. And therefore, for a number of us, it is, it is a painful question. Yes, all of us have a story, and for many of us, that story is not an easy one. And so as we think about this question, for some of us, it's a, an area of pain, an area of vulnerability. Some of us will feel damaged in this part of life. Some of us may be conscious of ways in which perhaps we've been damaging to others. Well, like many people in this city, and I'm sure a significant number of people in this room, my own story is one of only really having had romantic and sexual feelings for other men. It took me a long time to, to recognize that. I was a teenager in the early 90s. Uh, these conversations were not happening very openly at that kind of time. So it took me a few years to sort of recognize what was going on. I began to realize I was developing in a way that was different to most of my friends. I was at an all boys high school and so one of the only things we ever talked about was, was girls. And the question would often come around the friendship group, you know, who do you like? Who are you pursuing? Is there someone you're wanting to date? And as I could feel that question approaching me, I would sometimes change the subject. Um, at other times I would just have to make someone up. And so they would say, who, who do you like, Sam? And I'd think, quick, think of a girl's name, any girl's name, just think of a girl's name and say it out loud. Denise. Denise. Yeah, there's a girl called Denise that I like. Which wouldn't let me off the hook because they'd then say, oh, so do we know her? And I'd have to say, no. No, I don't think you know her. She's, um, yeah, she's not from around here, actually. She's from Norway, so no, you don't know her. <laughs> and you, uh, you never will. Funny old world. Never really occurred to people that Denise is not a traditional Scandinavian girl's name, but there we go. <laughs> but it was, a, it was a painful part of life. I, I was 14, 15, 16 years old. I just wanted to be like my other friends. And in this seemingly massive part of life, I was different to others. And I remember one day, I was 17 years old, standing at the bus stop, waiting to go home at the end of the day. And I remember as I was waiting for the bus, the thought just came into my mind, I think I'm gay. And as soon as those words kind of landed in my consciousness, I thought, well, yeah, that's clearly what's going on here. I don't have the romantic and sexual feelings for girls that my friends are always talking about, always describing. I, I do have those feelings for one or two of my friends. And at that very moment at the bus stop, I was in the middle of applying for different universities. All of them were in other cities. And I remember thinking, okay, this is something I can explore when I get to university. And then no one at home would ever need to know. I was thinking, maybe I can lead a bit of a double life. I'll go to university, I'll explore my sexuality there, and I don't need to tell anyone else back home. And that was what I was planning to do. But in between standing at that bus stop and, and arriving at university, something else happened, which was I became a Christian. Hadn't planned to. Wasn't part of my agenda. Wasn't spiritually seeking at that, that time of life. But a friend had invited me to his church's youth ministry. Um, I'd just finished my end of high school exams. I had a long summer with nothing else to do. So I thought, sure, why not? I'll come along and find out what my friend believes. 
and I heard the gospel for the first time and realized immediately that what I had imagined was the message of Christianity was very different to what I was hearing from the lips of Jesus. I'd assumed Christianity was about God congratulating good people. What I began to hear was that Christianity is about God coming to find lost people. And something in my 17-year-old spirit recognized something of myself and the word lost. Wasn't thinking of that because of my sexuality, wasn't really thinking about that at all. I was just thinking of it in terms of this. If there was a God who made me, if there was a God who really did create me, I didn't know him. And I figured I, I was probably supposed to. And that was probably on me. And therefore I was, by definition, lost from my creator. And so as I began to, to go week by week, I, I heard of a Christ who, who came to seek and save the lost, the Christ who came to die and rise again, to restore us to our, to our creator. And I became a Christian. So as a, as a brand new disciple who'd only recently come to terms with this sexuality, one of the big questions I had as a new Christian was, was what does Jesus think about my sexuality? Where does he land on this? I wanted to know, I wanted to follow Jesus in this part of life. And it might be a surprise to many of us that Jesus has anything to say on this at all. A lot of people are under the impression today that, that Jesus was neutral when it comes to sexuality. That he was kind of just tolerant of, of whatever people were into. He had strong opinions on the poor, he had strong opinions on oppression, but he didn't really have anything to say when it came to sexuality. I discovered as a new Christian, Jesus has some really significant things to say on this. Things that as I began to understand them as a new, as a new Christian disciple, I began to realize the things Jesus says on this completely change our perspective. My entire outlook on this area of life changed by listening to what Jesus has to say. So we're gonna look at one place where Jesus says some very foundational things on this. It's in Matthew chapter five, verses 27 and 28. It's a, a verse Kyle introduced us to last week. We're gonna kind of come back to it this week and explore it a bit further. And here's what I want us to see about Jesus. When it comes to sexuality, no one is more challenging than Jesus. But he's challenging to all of us. Second thing I want us to see is there is no one more dignifying than Jesus when it comes to this part of life. And then the final thing is there's no one who's more satisfying than Jesus when it comes to how we approach sexuality. So Matthew 5, verses 27 and 28, let me read these words to you. Uh, Jesus is speaking, he says, you have heard that it was said you shall not commit adultery, but I tell you that anyone who looks at a woman lustfully has already committed adultery with her in his heart. Okay, we're in the Sermon on the Mount, it's a, a section of Jesus' teaching, you may well be familiar with it. Uh, Jesus, our understanding is that Jesus was talking to a, an audience of, of male Jewish men, and in this part of the, the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus is taking some of the 10 commandments from the Old Testament, and he's contrasting how those commandments have been received with what they really mean. And so he says to them, you've heard that it was said, you shall not commit adultery. And that was true, they had heard that. This audience of men would have been nodding along and saying to Jesus, yeah, we, we've heard that many times, we're familiar with that commandment, we've been, we've been taught that lots and lots of times. Because the Old Testament had always been very clear. God's design for human sexuality was that, that sex was to be enjoyed only within marriage between a man and a woman. Any other kind of sexual activity was forbidden. Uh, sex before marriage, we see, is forbidden in the Bible. Same-sex relationships are forbidden in the Bible. Adultery is forbidden in the Bible. That was God's blueprint. That was God's design. It's not always a design that we find easy. There are times, certainly in my own life, I've, I've found that design to be difficult and painful. But it is what the Bible teaches from the beginning to the end. And so as Jesus says, you've heard that it was said you should not commit adultery. Again, everyone was going, yeah, 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 we know this. 
And in fact, many of those men would have been saying to Jesus, yeah, we, we know this commandment. And actually, Jesus, we've, we've kept this commandment. I'm sure many of those men would be thinking, you know, I've, I've never been unfaithful to my wife. I've never messed around with anyone else's marriage. I'm, I'm feeling pretty good on this. Okay, Jesus, you got me with one or two of those other commandments, fair game. But when it comes to this one, I'm feeling pretty confident. Jesus says, you've heard that it was said you shall not commit adultery. Then he says, but I say to you. He's implying something of a contrast is now going to come. And I wonder if for a split second his audience was thinking, I wonder if Jesus is, is going to change the rules on this. Maybe Jesus is going to say, hey, you've heard that it was said you shall not commit adultery. But I say to you, you've got to be true to yourself. Maybe Jesus is going to say, but I say to you, you've got to follow your heart. But instead, Jesus says in verse 28, I tell you that anyone who looks at a woman lustfully has already committed adultery with her in his heart. So here we see that Jesus is challenging Jesus is saying, hey, this commandment was never merely about regulating external behavior. This commandment was always about your attitude. Adultery is not just something that takes place in a bedroom. He's saying, it, it actually, it, it takes place in your heart. If I can put it this way, adultery is not just about what you do with your genitals. It's about what you do with your eyes. It's about how you look at someone. It's about what you do with your mind, how you think about someone. And Jesus says, if we look at someone lustfully, we have broken God's law. We've contradicted God's design. We're going against how human sexuality is meant to work. Because here's what's going on. When you look at someone lustfully, you are turning that person's sexuality into a commodity. You're turning it into something that is there for you to consume something that exists to satisfy your desires, to be taken by you, to gratify you. And here's why it matters. Jesus is saying, we're not just breaking some arbitrary commandment from hundreds of years ago. Jesus is saying, we're going against how God has made us to be, how God has designed this to work. Uh, we tend to think in our own kind of cultural time that, that sex is primarily about self-fulfillment and self-expression. The Bible shows us that, that actually sex is primarily about self-giving. It's a means of, of fusing a husband and a wife together at the deepest level in a relationship of mutual self-giving. Uh, and so the pastor, Tim Keller, says that Sex is a way of saying, I'm giving myself to someone fully, exclusively, and permanently. Fully because it's meant to involve the whole of who we are. Our entire person is being given to this other person. Exclusively because if I'm giving myself in totality to that person, I'm not giving myself in the same way to anyone else. Permanently because the, the bond this is designed to create is not meant to be undone and can't be undone without considerable pain. Uh, there was a Tom Cruise movie 20 years ago called Vanilla Sky, which most of us haven't seen if the box office returns or anything to go by. And it was a weird movie, I'm not going to lie, it's not one of his best ones. But there's a moment in that movie where, where Tom Cruise's character has a one-night stand with Cameron Diaz's character. And she challenges him on it. A bit later on in the movie, she, she confronts him and she says to him, when you sleep with someone, your body makes promises even if you don't. When you sleep with someone, your body makes promises even if you don't. That's what this commandment is getting at. That's how God has designed it to work. 
And so Jesus says, merely looking at someone lustfully breaks God's design. And so Jesus is challenging all of us. He's, he's saying this is an issue for every single one of us because this is an issue with the heart. It's a heart problem that every single one of us has. And this is, it turns out, the point of the Ten Commandments. Jesus is trying to show us in this part of the Sermon on the Mount the Ten Commandments were never given so that we could have an opportunity to prove how capable we are of living up to God's ways. The Ten Commandments were always given to us to show us our natural incapacity to live according to God's ways. They were there to show us that our relationship with God was always going to be based on his grace and forgiveness and never on our performance. And we see that so clearly when it comes to this area of sexuality. Now, I'm from England, and it's, uh, it's risky for a, an Englishman to talk to Americans about dentistry. <laughs> but when I go for my annual uh, visit to the dentist, we do have dentists in the UK. I know, I know there are at least four or five in the entire country. Um, <laughs> When I have my annual checkup, this is what happens. I know I've got my, my dentist appointment that day, so what do I do? That morning, I brush my teeth amazingly well. <laughs> I get, you know, several minutes will, will pass with me just brushing my teeth. I will burn hundreds and hundreds of calories in the process of brushing my teeth. <laughs> By the end of it, there's blood just kind of pouring out of my mouth. <laughs> Because I'm going to the dentist. I want him to be impressed. So I get to the dentist. You sit in the, the kind of space age seat thing with all the kind of gadgets on it. And he pokes around. He takes one of those what looks like an unfolded paper clips and pokes your gums with it. Um, that's, that's what dentists do if you want to learn how to be a dentist. That's, just do that. And then at some point, he'll have like a cup of, of what looks like kind of pink liquid. And he'll say, just, just take a, sw a, a sip of that, wash, it, wash your mouth around in it, and then spit it out, and it will show up the dirt that's on your teeth. And I'm thinking, not these teeth, sunshine. Okay? <laughs> Olympic level brushing happened this morning, not these teeth. So I'll take a bit, I'll sip it, I'll, I'll gurgle it around in my mouth, I'll spit it out, I'll, I'll smile and look in the little mirror, and I'll realize all I can see is, is fluorescent pink coming back out of my mouth. Jesus is showing us the purpose of God's law, the purpose of this very commandment is to show up the dirt that is in our hearts. To help us see that the gunk and the mess that is already there. So when Jesus shows us that commandment, you shall not commit adultery, the commandment is not there for us to go, yeah, I would never do that. The commandment is there to show us that's what my heart does all the time. This is what all of our hearts do. We have hearts that are adulterous. All of us misuse our sexuality. All of us misuse other people's sexuality. So my, my friend this morning, let me, let me please make this so clear to you because other people have twisted the message of Jesus on this. The message of Jesus to us is not hey, you are sexually pure and you have to maintain and steward your sexual purity and the moment you compromise it, the moment you mess it up, you've blown it for the rest of your life and you will forever be damaged goods. If that is the message of Christianity, none of us has any hope. No, Jesus' message is you never were pure, you have an adulterous heart. This stuff has always been baked into your heart. And so all of us, even in this one area of life, all of us need God's help and mercy. All of us are sexual sinners. All of us are broken in this part of life. All of us are ultimately in the same boat. And so there's not a person sitting in this room who is not gonna need the grace and mercy of Jesus in this part of life. Which means there's no place for looking down on other people because of their sexual sin. There's no place for demeaning anybody else. 
Jesus levels the playing field. All of us are in the same boat. All of us have the same ultimate issue with our hearts. The particularities will look different from person to person. Your attractions may look different from person to person, but we have the same ultimate issue. If there's one kind of sexual sinner that Jesus isn't good news for, he's not good news for any of us. And wonderfully, as, he's, as we'll see, he's come precisely to be good news for sexual sinners, which all of us need. So Jesus is challenging. Secondly, though, Jesus is dignifying in this area of life. Again, Jesus shows us if we look at someone lustfully, we've already broken God's law. But think about what Jesus is implying about the person being looked at. Jesus is saying that person has a sexual dignity that matters so much to Jesus that it mustn't be violated even in the privacy of someone else's mind. Why does God care who we sleep with? He cares even about the people we think about sleeping with. He cares how we think about them. So here's what we need to to understand this morning. You are broken in this part of your life. That's the challenging part. The dignifying part is that even you in your own brokenness, Jesus cares about how other people think about you. There may be other people who see your sexuality merely as a commodity, as a consumable. There may be people who think about your sexuality in all kinds of ways that you have no idea about. But Jesus knows. And it matters to him how people look at you and how people think about you. It surprises many of us, but Jesus actually has a high view of sexuality. It matters to him. Um, A friend of mine once said that how we think about sexuality is a bit like how we think about cars. I was spending a a few months, a few years ago, living in, in southern Ohio. I was... Uh, a visiting professor at a a school there, and I was going to be there for a semester, and so I needed a a set of wheels. And so the word went out. We got this Brit on campus. Does anyone have a spare car that he could use for a a few weeks? And two people offered me their vehicles very kindly. One one guy offered me his beaten-up old truck, okay? This thing had already long exceeded its life expectancy. It had tons of bumps and scrapes and dents in it. He was thinking... To be honest, it doesn't matter how a Brit drives this thing because it's, it's kind of beaten up already. Someone else offered me a convertible. Okay, I did not need to think long about which of those two vehicles to, to choose to drive. But here's the thing, that, that convertible was beautiful. I've no idea what the model was or any of those things. It was just a, it was a beautiful car. And so I drove that thing so carefully. Not just because it belonged to someone else, but because it was, it mattered so much. It was a beautiful machine. I even drove on the right-hand side of the road. I made that that special effort for them. (laughs) A lot of people think that the, the Bible has a low view of human sexuality. Many people in our culture do. Your sexuality is like a beaten up old truck. It really doesn't matter what you do with it. Jesus is showing us, no, our sexuality is is more like a convertible. It, It matters, it's precious. It's worth stewarding. One of the things that we tell ourselves in our our kind of culture today is we'll we'll say, well, it's just physical. Sex is just physical, It's, it's just a matter of biology. It's just People exchanging bodily fluids, no big deal. Christians really should stop making a fuss about it. But we know that's not the case. The Me Too movement has shown us that's not the case. 
we're becoming far more conscious of the damage done by sexual abuse. And as we do so, we, we begin to realize it's, the damage is, is not merely physical. It's profoundly psychological. The damage affects so much more than simply the body because sex is designed to be about far more than simply the body. It's not just physical. It matters, and so Jesus dignifies this part of our lives. It matters what we do with our sexuality. It matters what we do with someone else's sexuality. It matters what is done to us by others. But as well as being challenging and dignifying, Jesus is uniquely satisfying. Now, if, in one sense, we have too low a view of sex in our culture today. We say it's just physical, it doesn't mean anything. And on the other hand, we have too high a view of sex because we also say, this is what you need in order to be complete and fulfilled. And so if one mistake is to say sex doesn't mean anything, another mistake is to say it means everything. That you can't truly be you unless you fulfill your sexuality. Now, there is a reason we feel that way. Something in our, our instinct makes us feel as though perhaps sexual fulfillment will give me a sense of being whole and complete. It's not an accident that we look for that kind of, of completion in that part of life. Um, I'm told I don't know these things. Um, I'm told that our English word for sex comes from the Latin word sicari, which means to cut off, to separate, to amputate. And so sexuality has always been an area where we feel as though maybe this can relieve me from that feeling of being incomplete. Uh, the writer Ronald Rollheiser puts it this way. He says, we wake up in the world and in every cell of our being we ache consciously and unconsciously, sensing that we are incomplete, unwhole, lonely, cut off, a little piece of something that was once part of a whole. And what Jesus is showing us is that deep, instinctive sense of disconnection is not ultimately to do with sex. That's not what it's looking for. It's not sexual, it's spiritual. And so if one common line that people will say today is that, you know, people pursuing God, people desiring God, actually is all about, ultimately is about sexual fulfillment, it, Jesus flips that. He says, no, our, our longing for sexual fulfillment is ultimately because we're longing for God. That's where our deepest sense of disconnection comes from. And so when we're looking for sexual completion, the Bible shows us that we're looking for something beyond that. We're actually looking for, there's something more intense that we're desiring. There's a deeper longing. There's a closer union that we've been designed for. There's a greater consummation that can be found, and it's not gonna be found in sexual fulfillment. It's gonna be found in knowing our creator. And in the Bible, our sexuality is always meant to be a signpost to that ultimate love relationship we have with our God. Um, just to lower the cultural tone, think about the, the original Zoolander movie. If you've seen that movie, it's the, the premise of the movie is that the more good looking you are, the more stupid you are. I personally find that very offensive. Uh, the main character of the movie is Derek Zoolander. He's, he's a male model. He's very good looking, which means in the movie he's really stupid. And there's a scene in the movie where they've decided they're going to build a school in his name. And so they have an architect's model all kind of built and ready for him to come and look at. And they're, they're excited for him to see it and to see what the school is going to look like. And he comes into the room, he sees this, the model of the, of the school building, and he's furious. And he says, this is... Is this a school for ants? He says, it's far too small. 
I'm not going to do the voice. Some, I can hear some of you in your minds doing the voice. And that the stupidity of the scene is he's mistaken the model for the real thing. And every time we think that romantic and sexual fulfillment will make our lives complete, we've mistaken the model for the real thing. Human sexuality has been given to us to point us to a much deeper need, a much deeper longing. And so when Jesus walked to this earth, he didn't just call himself the Christ, he didn't just call himself the Redeemer, the Savior, the Son of God or the Son of Man, he also calls himself the Bridegroom. Because that's who God has always been. The God of the Bible has always shown himself not just simply to be the deity up in the sky somewhere, but the divine husband who can't help but make lavish, lavish covenant promises to those he, he loves. And his people in the Bible are not merely his, his kind of his followers, but they are his bride, his beloved. And so it's significant when Jesus arrives on the scene and he describes himself as the bridegroom, he's saying, I am that divine husband that you've been waiting for. I am the one who is there to fulfill your deepest longings, to meet the greatest needs of your heart. And Jesus does so by dying for us. In his death on the cross, he was cut off. He was made incomplete. He was made unwhole. So that we could be drawn in. So that we could be filled up. So that we could be made complete. And that's what we begin to find as we come to him. That's been my experience. As a, as a Christian, following the, the teaching of the Bible, following the, the ethics that Jesus gives us, I've remained single. I'm, I'm not married. And there's times, for sure, when that can be difficult. But I found that if I have Jesus, it doesn't ultimately matter whether or not I get married. The most fully human and complete person who ever walked this earth was Jesus. He was never married. He was never in a romantic relationship. He never had sex. And the moment we say that any of those things is essential for being a complete human being, we're saying that Jesus was not fully human. We're calling our Savior subhuman. No, Jesus shows us what is essential what does make us complete, what does give us the chance to truly be authentically who we most are is a relationship with him. And if we have Jesus, we have the ultimate bridegroom. If we have Jesus, we ultimately lack nothing. He is challenging and challenging to every single one of us in this room today. He's dignifying. Whatever we've done, however we feel, Jesus is dignifying to us. And he's satisfying. Because he alone can meet the deepest needs the deepest longings, the deepest yearnings of our hearts. So let's pray to him now. Our Father, we thank you for Jesus and those words feel so inadequate, but we thank you for Jesus. We thank you that he speaks into this part of life that we don't have to try and figure this out on our own, but he has given us his wisdom, his truth. More than that, Father, he doesn't just diagnose what's wrong with our hearts, but in his own death and resurrection has come to give us new life, to give us forgiveness, to give us hope, to give us a future, to give us our humanity back. 
And we thank you, Lord, that as we come to Jesus, as we trust in him, as we follow him, we discover in him all that our hearts were ultimately longing for all of this time. We find the bridegroom. We find ultimate love. And so we praise you for him, Lord. We pray that his love and embrace would be fresh to us this day, that once again we would collapse into the arms of Jesus and know ourselves to be precious and beloved in his arms. And we pray in his name. Amen. Occasionally, um, note takers, um, just helping you out. There's some of my thoughts. I'm just gonna kind of share some of these and I just wanna talk to a few of you. Um, Jesus is the most challenging, most dignifying, and the most satisfying. And um, I think all of us know that when it comes to this topic, it's challenging for all of us. In every single one of us, it's a, it's a challenge. Um, but I loved what he said, didn't you, about, um, but Jesus is also the most dignifying. Wasn't that powerful? Just to see a friend, how much worth he sees in you. Um, and I just wanna say this, can I just stop and say this to somebody that needs to hear this in the room? You're worth more than you know. And I know because of your past, you know, because of your hurt, because of what you felt when you were 17, I know because of the relationship that you feel stuck in now, I know because of the future that you can't forecast, I know that you don't feel worth much. And I just wanna say to you as your brother, you are worth more than you know. And he sees you. So I just, I, even as he said that, I just felt like, man, there's a whole lot of people need to hear that. And then he is also the most satisfying I just love what he said, if Jesus isn't good news for me, that's how I heard it, he isn't good news for anyone. Brother, sister, let me just remind you, um, he is the most satisfying and he's good news. He's good news for, a, uh, you know, you've heard my story of a broken inner city, messed up kid like me and he's good news for you as well. And we all have a range of things, but man, I love what he said at the end, but if we have Jesus family, we lack nothing. And I'm so grateful for this family. I'm so grateful for this home. But I just wanna say this, that literally right now um, is a great opportunity. I, I, I feel this this morning myself. For us to lean into two things. We're gonna do this. Uh, we're gonna lean into his grace and we're gonna lean into his power. So we're gonna take communion together and literally this is the perfect representation of what a lot of us need in the room. And that is... Family, there's a whole lot of us that when it comes to sexuality and all that's happened in our lives, we need a lot of grace. And I just want you to know, he gave more than we can comprehend. And when it comes to this topic, I think we also need his power. There are some things that you're looking for that this stirs up in you, impossible things for the people around you or someone you're close with, or just something you just, you literally, you've tried for years, you just don't feel like you can get through it. And I just wanna remind you this morning that not only did he pour out his blood so that we could walk in grace, he also left the tomb empty so that we would understand and taste what his power is like. He still does the impossible. So let's just come to him, family, right now. We're just gonna, I'm just gonna invite you to take communion. Uh, if you've put your faith and trust in Christ, then we're just, gonna, we're just gonna spend some time worshiping. If you have a conversation to have with him, have it. If you're in here and you're like, man, I don't have anybody and I need to have a conversation, I've got questions, then, then A, come tonight. The, you know, he's gonna talk about a lot of stuff. I've heard him talk, why he has the ring. There's a million things. It's really gonna be a great conversation tonight. But if you're like, no, I just need like a one-on-one, -on -one, that's great. Like to my right, to your left is the next step room. We'd love to have a conversation with you. Answer your questions, just talk, man.
pray over you. We'll walk with you. Whatever you need, we'd love to help. But either way, we just, let's just all of us, let's just respond. Let's be good soil uh, to whatever it is Jesus is in us. Let's do that together.
Worldwide Southeast Online family. What a great weekend. I'm so grateful for Sam's uh, message, and I, I really hope that it connected with you uh, because it needs to be more than information, guys. It needs to get down into this heart level. Love to journey with you. Uh, as always, we say this all the time, and we mean it. Text the word CONNECT to 733-733, and we're going to follow up with you. It's not a bot. It's not a pre and done thing. It's, it's our team connecting with you and zeroing in on what God's doing in your heart. And I really hope today's message did. Uh, joining me right now, though, is Derek uh, in New Mexico with Rob and Gloria Miller. We mentioned at the beginning of service, if you missed it, go check it out. We got our online fam there. But Derek, you were just taking in the, the great weekend message in New Mexico today. What were you and Rob thinking? Yeah, Stephen, first off, it's still so cold here in the desert this morning. <laughs> uh, second of all, we had a great time worshiping. Love Sam's message. You know, just the yep. idea and the reminder that we're all broken in this area in terms of sexual sin, whether it's physically or in our hearts. And yet, yep. no matter our story, uh, there is grace for each and every one of us. And so that is such yeah. an encouraging message. Uh, and thank Sam for us. That, that was an awesome message. All right, Derek. Thank you so much. Good to see you. Tell Robin Gloria I said hello. And joining me right now is Sam here for the interview, buddy. I, what a great message. Derek and Rob are just seconds ago talking about uh, just the articulation that we're all impure before God, that, that it just starts in that heart level. So yeah. just kind of take us into that for a second. Yeah, we, we need that because I think so much of the, even the messaging we hear from parts of the Christian world is you've, you've got to be pure and remain pure on this, otherwise you've blown it, Yeah, which is the opposite of the gospel. If, yeah. that, if that's really the message of Jesus, none of us have any hope. Well, I wrote that down. I'd heard this years ago, which is it's either hope for everyone or it's hope for no one. Exactly. Exactly that. So no one is so far gone that they are out of reach of the love and, and grace and redemption of Jesus. Mm -hmm. And none of us are so good that we can look around and feel <laughs> smug or kind yeah. of, you know, self-satisfied. So if he's not good news for all of us, he's not good news for any of us. Yeah, I loved your dentist analogy because I think, first of all, we can all identify when it's dentist morning. You guys know this. You're going to you're going <laughs> to dial in, right? You're going to. Yeah, yeah. But what's what I find interesting is don't we do that with the, the purity of our heart? Yeah. Like we make these last ditch efforts to to self purify, to self atone. Yep. So give us some hope. And like, how does the gospel <laughs> intersect our hearts right there in this area where sometimes it is so hard and so tempting to want to self atone, to want to pay that price yeah. ourselves? Well, the, the, the great news is Jesus. Jesus really doesn't know our hearts. He knows them better than we do. So uh -huh. and he, he still. <laughs> He still wants something to do with us. So yeah. we, we, we don't understand the full depth of the sin in our hearts, but Jesus does, and he's come precisely for that reason. So we may begin to feel overwhelmed with some of the brokenness that we see inside ourselves, but however, however significant our sin is, Jesus is bigger. Yeah. That's the thing I keep coming back to. There's always more grace in Jesus than there is sin in me. There's always more purity in Jesus than impurity in me. So I do need to come to terms with what my heart is like, but having done that, I can then receive the love and grace and forgiveness of Jesus. Yeah. And I, I can rest in that. If it's down to me, I'll never really know if I've pulled it off or not. I'll never really know if I've done enough to atone. But with Jesus, I can. He, he's paid for it all. I can, I can breathe. I can exhale. I can rest now. One of the things that you said about sexuality that I really... I really liked the way you articulate it, which is we both equally hold it in too low of you and yeah. too high of you all at the same time. Yeah. And one of the things we see I love about Jesus is he does tensions, right? Yep. We don't run to the extremes, but we want to. Yeah. He holds them beautifully together. Yeah. And, and I like the way you went into that part about running to the extreme, but really we need to find that ground. And because Jesus gives us the model for what that is, and we can almost apply that to anything. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. He, he will always show us that, that no good thing in this world is everything. Yeah. And it's not nothing either. It, yeah. it matters, but it can never matter as much as he does. So he helps us dignify the various parts of our humanity, the various mm -hmm. things in this life. He helps us dignify them without worshiping them. Yeah. So we can, we can put them in their right place and not abuse them and misuse them. That's a really good quotable. I dignify without worshiping. Yeah, so marriage, yeah. Jesus helps us dignify marriage yeah. because he shows us marriage is ultimately pointing to his relationship with yeah. us, but we can't worship marriage precisely because it is penultimate. It is pointing to the thing that is ultimate. So yeah. 
we can honor it without being consumed by it. Yeah, penultimate, good use of the word. It means secondary to the main thing. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. it comes before and points yep. to the main thing. I love that. that. That's ultimately what all our relationships do is it exactly. models uh, the one that is to come. So two things I want to close out with our time with. One, yeah. you've written a book new. Tell us about it. It's all about our bodies. Why'd you write it? Why would we want to pick it up? And who's it for? Yeah. So the book is called What God Has to Say About Our Bodies. It's not the most imaginative title I've come up with, but um, it does what it says. It does what it says. So it's a book about how Jesus is good news for our bodies, mm -hmm. um, both in terms of showing us that the, our bodies are not accidental, they're not incidental, they do have meaning, they do have dignity. We've mm -hmm. been fearfully and wonderfully made. Um, our bodies now belong to Jesus if we're mm -hmm. Christians. That's, that's actually liberating and reassuring because if I belong to Jesus, the only person my body really has to please is Jesus. Mm -hmm. um, that was liberating when I first realized that. And we have a, a bodily future with Jesus. Paul talks about waiting for the redemption of our bodies. So as someone who's now in his late 40s, um, my best physical days aren't behind me. They're ahead <laughs> of me because there's a resurrection to look forward to. So yeah. this is not the only bodily experience I'm ever going to have. And isn't that true? Like, I, I see that in so many ways, not just with sexuality, but with a lot of different ways that we cling to this tent of a body. Yeah. Um, and again, you got to hold it in the right tension, right? It yeah. doesn't mean you disregard the body, no. but it doesn't mean it's also the only body. Yeah. It, you know, and I, I love that you're speaking to that. I don't know of another book that's got that title and addresses that so yeah. so perfectly. So I do love that. Uh, and I'm also excited. I want to let everybody know if you're near a Blankenbaker campus um, in Louisville, Kentucky, this is for you local folks. You're going to have a conversation tonight. We're calling it a family conversation yep. with uh, Kyle and Sam, uh, where it's just going to be a chance uh, to you guys to talk. So it's not going to be online. It's going to be in person only. We're going to be right in there. Yep. You guys are going to be talking about just some questions that have come up. Yeah, no questions off limits. So yep. happy to have that conversation. I'm looking yeah. forward to it. Yeah, Sam, I appreciate it. One thing I want to say, guys, is don't, it's so tempting to weaponize books sometimes and say, here, read this thing, here, read this thing. Yeah. Uh, speak to the grace of that. You know, like when we just want to put something in someone's face and saying, here, you need to read this. Yeah. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Like, how do we share this graciously? I think we, we just want people to realize there is, there is hope in Jesus. Yeah. And so anything that can get us into that hope in Jesus, he said, come to me all who are weary and heavy laden. Yeah. And I will give you rest. And yeah. so what I'm trying to do with my ministry, what I'm trying to do with my own heart is, <laughs> is keep daily finding my rest in the finished work of Jesus and all that he's done yeah. for me. And to help anyone get in on this who's not got anything yet. Absolutely. Stay Sam, thank you. Us. Yeah. Thank you so much for joining us here. My pleasure. Uh, great message. And you at home, I, I really hope that today's message connected with you um, and challenged the way you see the grace of God and maybe saw that anew and saw it fresh. So don't forget about that. Uh, tonight, I also want to remind you, we got an SE Online Bible study from Exodus to Easter going on. Uh, check out our Facebook for all the information on that, Southeast Online Community on Facebook. Uh, Tuesday night at 8 p.m., we got a great video content coming out with that. Other than that, guys, thank you for being a part of Southeast Online. We love you. We care about you. If there's any way we can serve you, we'd love to find out how we can do that. We'll see you all back next week. Bye, everyone.